you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. Well, hello, and welcome to Launch Street. Tamara here, and do I have an interesting interview for you today. Do you play an instrument? Have you ever been in a band? I have not. But it turns out that music can teach us a lot about a business, especially an orchestra. There's a conductor, a leader. You can hear the difference if your teammates on the trumpet aren't doing their job, and timing and collaboration matter. I, okay, so here's the deal. I discovered all of this on today's interview with Roger Nirenberg. He's the conductor behind the unforgettable learning experience, the music paradigm, that many teams and organizations go through. The organization's people who are participants, not just audience members, are seated with a live professional orchestra where they can observe highly trained musicians as they perform. The participants' attention is drawn to kind of fascinating and unexpected organizational dynamics with the orchestra. And I just have to tell you, as he walked me through the experience and I looked at some videos, it is phenomenal to see how we in business, once we kind of are in, embedded, I guess, in an orchestra, actually get it. We get team dynamics in a way that maybe we didn't see them before. It's so interesting. This interview is fascinating. So are you ready for a wild ride? Because here we go. Roger, welcome to Inside Launch Street. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. So what's your first memory of being innovative? Well, it's hard to think of a single one, but I think I was about 10. And uh, I had just discovered the Beethoven symphonies. And uh, I, I was obsessed. I was obsessed with them. And, and I just was beginning uh, playing an instrument. And I knew how to write music. And I, I wanted to write something like that. And so I started writing music. Um, and they were all imitations of the Beethoven Third Symphony, um, shameful uh, imitations. But uh, but that began my uh, career as a composer. So you've always been into music or musical, I guess. Well, not as young as some people. You know, many people start when they're three or four. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't really start until I was about eight or nine or ten. Really, ten was when I, I really fell in love with it. Mm. What is it that you love about it so much? Oh, that's a little hard to say. It's just, it's so profoundly beautiful. The, it's not just that it's pretty. It's, it's beautiful in a kind of a very truthful way. It seems to reveal to you some of the inner secrets of what it is to be alive, alive and how, how beautiful it is to be alive. And, um, in such a variety of ways, and uh, it just makes everything, uh, everything else kind of disappear, and and you join into into this imaginary world of in which everything is so extraordinarily beautiful. So I bet at this point, launch traders are going, this is a business innovation podcast. Why are you talking about music? So let's fast forward. And get us all on the same page. Describe what you do with the music paradigm. What it is, what it achieves. Well, the music paradigm is a learning experience for organizations. Uh, Organizations engage me to appear at their important meeting. And I hire an orchestra from the locality, wherever it is. And um, we show up. Before before the participants arrive in the room, we spend an hour rehearsing, and then the participants come in. They discover there's an orchestra in their meeting room, and not only that, but they're sitting inside the orchestra. They're in a position that they've never been before, and um, they're alongside the musicians, sprinkled all about, and it begins as a kind of a tour of the orchestra. 
But you see, in advance, I, my client has told me what the meeting is about and what its goals are and what they're trying to accomplish. What are, what are the challenges that they're facing and what are the opportunities that they have and what's at stake? So I know all these things and then I cogitate on it before, before the meeting and I design role-playing exercises, which I, I spring on the musicians spontaneously. And so it begins as a kind of a fascinating tour about various things about orchestras that people don't know. But the more these role-playing exercises are, are being done, the, the orchestra begins to seem more and more like their own workplace. The same kind of issues that happen to them at work are happening in, in the orchestra. But because it's music, uh, it's much easier to connect the dots in, in the musical reality than it is in the much slower unfolding real reality. So, so that the, the insights are much clearer and much stronger and not only are they cognitive, but they're also, they can feel them. And they feel them with their emotions, but they also feel them with their bodies because their bodies are resonating with the sound that's so close. So it turns into this amazingly powerful learning experience that makes people reflect on, on themselves at work, on their own power, it makes them realize powers that they had that they hadn't seen before. It makes them realize opportunities. It makes them see some of the things about their behavior that they didn't know and they read that are kind of embarrassing, but nobody is confronting them. They're discovering this all on their own. So before we dig into, I, I want to get into some actual kind of real world stories of what's come out of it, but, but before we get specific, Will you help us understand, you know, how does how, how does an orchestra of music help in leadership and business in a, in a way that just having that discussion does it? I mean, I think you tapped on it a little bit with kind of they're sitting in the orchestra, they feel the music. Why does that work so well? Well, it's very dramatic. So, for example, one of my clients uh, was doing a huge transformation that they, it was a five-year transformation. First of all, it was a huge organization, and they were fundamentally changing the nature of their business. And they, they decided that the only way that this was going to be successful, because so much was at stake, was if the leadership, the entire leadership of the organization bought into it and exercised a kind of leadership was, which was beyond just making sure that mistakes weren't made. It had to be an active, engaged, communicative kind of leadership. That's what they wanted from their leaders. So one of the role plays that I did was I asked the orchestra, I identified a particular passage, and then I said in this performance now, the principal players, the leaders, you know, the, let's say 20% of the orchestra, was going to commit completely to the performance. But the rank and file, the remaining 80%, were going to do as little as possible without getting caught. Well, that's kind of humorous because nobody ever asked them to do that. But they did it. And, and what happened, what everybody heard, was that the orchestra sounded fine because the 20% was so good that they kind of carried it. And nobody really heard anything that was wrong. And then I pointed out to them that – in spite of their, the surprised looks on their faces, that this really shouldn't surprise them because we all know that that's the way things work in the real world, that most organizations do not realize their potential, the potential that they actually have. And I said, you wouldn't even think this was a dysfunction until you heard the following. And then I said, what would it be like if every musician gave everything that you know to this performance? And then the orchestra plays the same passage, and wow, it's so different. And everybody not only they not only hears it, but they feel it, and it's such a completely different energy. And then I point out what a challenging demonstration this is for any leader, because if you're the leader, that's what you have to do. Um, that's the role that you have to play. So what this does is it it makes pe leaders see their role in a different way and see their opportunity and see what's acceptable and what is just doesn't cut it 
in the coming challenges that the organization is facing. So that's one example. What are I've got actually got two questions kind of in one. So I'll kind of save at the same time and then kind of, you know, answer in the right order for you. Um, one is what are some, I think you kind of just mentioned it, right? The 20% of the people are doing extraordinary work and everybody else is getting by and it's, you don't even notice it really like it's getting by and that what, what everybody realizing potential looks like, what are the other types of kind of big themes or patterns do you see coming out of these sessions together? And then my other kind of layer to that is what has come out of one of your sessions that act, an insight maybe or a, a realization that actually surprised you maybe you didn't expect? Well, let's take those one at a time. Yeah. Uh, I think the world is changing fast. Uh, we all know that, and it's changing in so many ways. Just if we take like the technological innovations and the way that it's disrupting so many businesses and so many industries that huge organizations can go out of business in just a couple of years in mm -hmm. this in this rapidly uh, changing environment. And so every organization, every single organization is scrambling to try to organize themselves so that they can survive in the coming time, not only survive, but thrive. So, and what that requires of, of uh, workers at every level, leadership and those who are taking the directions, requires them to be agile and flexible and to work fast and in, in just in effect to be competitive. Uh, so that's one of the themes that, that we touch on. Well, the orchestra is a fantastic vehicle for demonstrating that in real time because in the directions at one point that I give, I ask the orchestra to change and do something one way and then another way and then another way in real time. And, they, and I ask them to do this without conductor. And they see, they stand as if it's some kind of magic trick that's happening. <laughs> It takes them a while to realize that this is actually a human capacity, that when humans are dedicated to, to responding collectively and to working together and prizing the collective result above whatever the individual interest would be, that they can accomplish incredible things. That's just one example. Yeah, and that's, you know, I think it's to your point about the collective and yet everybody playing an important part, because if you're missing some of those parts, the collective doesn't work as well. It's kind of a little bit to what you were saying earlier. That's right. And I sometimes do that. I'll take one seemingly insignificant part and I'll ask, and I'll ask them not to play. And then everybody, you know, everybody else in the orchestra plays and it sounds fine. And then I add this one little element, like let's say it's the triangle. You know, this small instrument in the back of the orchestra, but when people are focused on it, they begin to realize that that one instrument adds so much value. And, of course, people are reflecting about themselves. They're re reflecting about their own value, but they're also reflecting about the value of, of their colleagues whose, whose role they had under, underestimated until then. So it's this becomes a space for a lot of introspection. That has got to be a great lesson in um, recognizing the value that your team members bring. Because I, you know, I often hear from people, well, we, you know, our team does this, but that team does over there doesn't. I don't quite understand what they do. That's very, very common. Yeah, so interesting. And what what happens as a result of that is that organizations lose competitive advantage because so often the competitive advantage comes from collaboration across boundaries. And that's a big responsibility for the leader because only the leader can really uh, encourage and promote cross-boundary collaboration. You know, I, uh, before you go on, I love the way you said that for uh, us launch treaters listening, uh, the collaboration across Boundaries. I think it's easy to collaborate with the person right next to you, but it's harder to kind of to recognize the importance of that collaboration with people upstream and downstream. And I think that through music, you can help people see that it's it's the people kind of up and down and sideways of you, not just the people right in your little area. That's right. And that musicians are incredibly good. They, they even have a kind of expression for it. It's putting their ears on long poles and suddenly they're hearing across the stage that, to things that are far away. And that's a capacity that musicians have to cultivate and that conductors have to have to uh, encourage musicians to do. But in a room, you can, it becomes very real. 
And, um, and in my sessions, it's not only demonstrations, but there are dialogues in which I, I, I talk to the musicians about, you know, well, how did you do that? What's the capacity? But all the dialogue that I'm doing is targeted towards the challenges and the opportunities of the client organization. So although it seems like we're talking about music, the whole time we're really talking about the client organization, about their organization and what's going on in it. And let's go to the second part of that question. Um, what are any insights that have come out that you thought, oh, I didn't, that's an interesting one. I wouldn't have seen that one coming. Well, yeah, here's, here's one. I, I, I also do sessions sometimes with string quartets. And um, in one, I had one uh, very well-known organization as a client, but it was the very top, top of the company. It was the CEO plus the 10 uh, presidents of the various different divisions. And, um, and so we had a breakout group, and there's some discussion, musicians included. And uh, one of the people came back reporting the insights he had, and he said that – he said – when the musicians talk about and about what they're doing, they tend to be forward looking. They tend to be aspirational. They tend to be about what they're what they're going to aim for the next time. He said, in our organization, we're always backward looking. Right. We're looking at the data that just happened. We're trying to analyze what happened, and we don't give much attention to the to the, we don't give equal attention to the aspirations and the possibilities. So I thought that was really quite remarkable, the way, the way that that man understood this and articulated it. And of course, that's a really powerful idea and a powerful insight. You know, I, I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you know, I'm in corporate America too, that the people who are coming in to do this meeting and this orchestra, they're not musicians, right? Maybe some of them are every now and again, but generally speaking, it's people like me who maybe took something in high school. <laughs> Yes. So what is, is there something to it of um, not just the orchestra part of it, which is obviously very powerful, but also this kind of trying something new. I mean, it's got to be so uncomfortable and awkward at first. Well, that's an excellent, it's really very insightful question. Uh, you see, the changes that a lot of my client organizations are need to bring about are not comfortable for their people because people are much more comfortable doing the things that have always been successful. And they're not, they're not, they, they have a stake in not changing. And it's very difficult to, to get people to open up to that. So what happens in, and, and one of the greatest barriers is the previous success that they've had, that they're holding on to. So, what happens in this environment is whereas all that all that kind of prestige and that um, uh, status that they have, well, they walk into a room where it doesn't matter. It's a new environment. It's an environment and they don't know the rules. And so in a way, they're in a position where they're all the things that are holding them back, they have to give them up. And that's done quite intentionally because we know how difficult it is to get people to change. Everybody knows that. As a matter of fact, it's difficult for us. But if you're in an environment in which everything is new and different, but then if that environment proves to be fascinating and delightful as well and humorous and tremendous fun, it's just the ideal learning playground for for the kinds of changes that you're going to need to accept one way or another. You know, I have to imagine that um, particularly in organizations that are dealing with maybe some hierarchy issues, um, that going into a situation like this, because if I heard you right, it's almost an even playing field because all that stuff gets left behind. Your accolades, your titles, what you're good at, um, your ability to tell somebody else what to do because they're no longer in that role. So it must help in, in that scenario. The big bonuses that you've made, yeah, all, right. <laughs> all the people that are telling you what what you want to hear, they think you want to hear because you have power over them. All that's gone, and you're just an ordinary person in a, in a, a place where you don't really understand what the rules are. How long does this does the experience take typically? I mean, I'm sure you customize, but what's your average time to kind of from this? They come into the room to they're leaving with these profound insights. 
it's an hour and a half with the orchestra and then an additional half hour with just the client organization in a question and answer. Uh, which is important because the experience is so rich and it's so rich for for so many senses that it takes it takes people a while to start making all the connections that uh, that can be helpful. And then people constantly talk about the fact that they keep on making connections hours after it's over. I'm curious from an innovation perspective. When I'm talking about innovation, I'm not talking about. Um, you know, just the new product or new technology, but but the idea to think, the ability to think differently about what's in front of you, your challenges, your opportunities, new process developments, new products, what, whatever it is, kind of applying that to your role in the organization, whatever that may be. How does this experience, the music paradigm, help with sparking some of that innovation that's inside people, but maybe they're not utilizing or not realizing, kind of to your point earlier about not realizing our potential? Another really excellent, insightful question. Uh, in, in the music paradigm, people don't really learn anything new. The ideas are things that people know already. But what happens is that they connect the dots in a different way. So they might look at the same things that they've always been looking at every day, but they appear different because the relationships and the meaning and and it's especially the connections are different. And then you discover that there's you have more power. And that's that's really innovation that by power. I mean, you have the ability to affect the quality of your work in ways that you hadn't realized, but were always there. And I think that's that's really powerful. It sounds to me like, you know, not to kind of you know blow smoke, but that people really leave with a, a bit of a personal transformation out of an experience like this. I mean, I, I can really see myself going into it and walking away kind of profoundly changed about my role and my ability to contribute and my ability to innovate. Yeah, I, I think that that's right. I don't think that's overstating it because people talk about how powerful it was. And the interesting thing is, you know, when you have a powerful transformative experience, most often it's something that you do alone. But this is something that a group does together. And yet everybody's everybody's particular experience is entirely personal to them. And it's all happening within the way you think about things. And there's no, nobody's confronting you about it. Nobody's asking you to explain what's going on. It's just an experience. But, um, but it's so bonding for the organization, for everybody to have, have been in the same room and have been having these feeling rich experiences at the same time. Do you ever follow up with uh, teams a year or even six months, I suppose, after they do it? I'm, I'm curious how, what, you know, you had, I'm sorry, I'm talking in circles. You had said earlier, like, you know, sometimes those insights take a while to percolate. They don't always get them right away because it's there's so much spinning in your head after an experience like this. And then I think it takes time for people to then take action on those kind of insights and transformations that they have. So... When you can, you know, follow up with them in six months or, or a year, kind of what are you hearing from them down the road? Because, you know, you and I both know going in with clients, it's one thing to have an amazing experience, another one for people to actually then sustain that yeah. learning. Uh, I have not made it my business to, um, to collect data. And when I ask my clients about it, they say the kinds of changes, important as they are, are things that are hard to measure. But anecdotally, I hear a lot. For example, I remember one client said to me, he said, when I plan, carefully planned this three-day conference and you know, spent so many million dollars on it, he said, I knew that your, that your portion of it was going to be successful. What I didn't know was that six months later, it would be the only thing that my people remember. <laughs> I mean, I'm not surprised. That's that's such a different experience. And I've got to imagine shocking to the system. It is it is shocking in a in an entirely delightful way. And that's no accident. That's something that I really I worked into the design, because if it becomes threatening, if it becomes unpleasant, if it becomes painful, 
then the whole experience won't work. It has to be it has to be delightful. It has to be playful. It has to be fun. And I make it that way. And part of the reason, because the musicians don't know what's going to happen, it, it's fun for them. You can imagine how much fun it is for them to role play at, you know, doing as little as possible without getting caught, you know, because they're play acting. Right, right. It's fun There's for a, everybody. It's fun for everybody. And at the same time, it's very, it's very challenging because they're wondering, is this going on in my workforce? Is this, is this what I'm losing in, in my own people? You know, that kind of thing. So it's that combination of something which is, which is very challenging, but also very delightful that makes the learning possible. Yeah, you know, your comment earlier in that experience, an example that you shared about the, you know, 20% give it your all and the other 80% let's just, you know, do what you have to to get by. I think as someone who's led teams and organizations, that's probably one of my biggest fears in my team is there's people who are semi-engaged, but I can't tell because things are moving good enough. Right, yeah. And that's one of the things about music is you're in a world where you can tell because musicians turn behavior into results instantaneously. And so it's this fantastic laboratory where you can try on one behavior and see what it does, and then you can try on another and another, and, and then you begin to, to connect. That's how, what enables you to connect the dots, because in real life, the connection becomes much more tenuous. Right, and I think you know the reality is in real life you can rationalize um, just about anything, even the data. And with music, there's a very clear difference in, you know, version one versus version two. That's right. And, and I make sure that the, the difference is not so subtle that, that the participants can't hear it. I, I choose my exercises carefully because I know that I'm dealing with an audience which is, is not a trained audience and not a music-loving audience. You don't have to love music in order to derive a lot from it because I, I designed it in such a way that you'll be able to navigate through it. Yeah, you had mentioned earlier that um, you know, you've had some clients who have gone through some major transformation. They were changing how they were trying to do things. Um, what are other reasons clients pick up the phone and call you? I'm, I'm curious about the pain or challenge that something like this is ideal for solving. Well, you know, I've had hundreds of clients and I've been doing this for 20 years. So I have many. Um, and every organization, ha they get together from time to time. They bring their people together to review what happened in the last year and to, to talk about what's going to happen and make sure that they're aligned and that they're working as one organization. They, they understand what it is that we're all trying to do. And I think it's for those meetings that I get engaged mostly. The ones that are the kind of strategic planning, for lack of a better way to say it. Yes. But, you know, sometimes... It'll be a sales force that 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 uh, that I'm meeting. Uh, another time, it'll be an organization that's just undergoing a merger, and they want to make sure that it goes smoothly because they understand the stakes. Uh, if if it doesn't work, um, there there are many different organizations. I remember once there was an aerospace uh, a company that was competing for a contract for the next generation of the shuttle. And it was about a team and it was about how they were going to work together. You know, you had said something in the beginning that I thought was actually really profound. And it was this and you said it kind of hinted to it a few times after. And it was this idea that with music and with this experience with the orchestra, you can actually immediately physically feel, see, hear, experience the result of the things that you're talking about. Where oftentimes in the business world in particular, the things we're talking about feel very fuzzy, very subjective, very hypothetical. Um, and with music, you, you bring it to life immediately. Are there ways to apply that principle in our everyday life? Well, if you're, on, if you're asking, is there a way that we can more immediately see the results of what we do, the impact of what we do? Yeah, it, it could be. I mean, I just, you know, your point about the 80-20, and I know that takes an orchestra to do that. But I'm thinking, of, you know, back to some of the meetings I've had where I thought, wow, if I could make this real for people, 
they'd really get it. But instead I'm spinning my wheels because it's all this kind of hypothetical conversation where you can't really see the result the way you can with music. Are there ways that you can kind of apply what you're talking about here on a, on a if not smaller, more immediate scale, you know, before I get to something like the music paradigm? Yeah. You, uh, you ask really good questions. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Go on. I'm kidding. <laughs> I think there is, um, but it, it in, in, for me, it involves some musical sensibilities. For example, it involves becoming uh, sensitive to um, the kind of energy that's going on between people, um, maybe manifest in their nonverbal behavior, in their, their body language, um, the kind of energy field that they create that you can you can sense in a room that people are just not really listening. Right. Of course, in in the um, the title of my book, the subtitle of my book is uh, a surprising story about leading by listening. And so much uh, uh, in music is done by developing very high powered listening. But if you if you bring listening on that of that caliber into into you know meetings and encounters with people and you're an exceptionally good listener yourself full of of empathy and imagination and uh, the ability to to really stay focused on what somebody's saying and not focused on your your rebuttal or your reply or something that's going to make you look good let's say um that that gives you an opportunity to to kind of do what you were talking about, which is to to make the result more evident, because those things are kind of subtle, those signs that I'm talking about. And you have to be attuned to them. And then you have to also trust that that really matters. You know, for launch readers, for the, us listening, I, I think what Roger here is talking about, about reading the energy in a room is so important. I think we get so wrapped up in trying to look smart, present the idea, you know, make the room laugh, but we're not really paying attention to the actual energy and connections that are happening in the room. And, and that, I think, kind of to what you're saying, in music has to happen for it to work, particularly with an orchestra, and we're not doing that nearly enough in a meeting. Well, we're trained... In business, you know, we're trained on our output. You know, we're trained what we're going to say. You know, and we're not really trained very much on how to listen. Now, there was a there was a young musician who came to me for a coaching in public speaking because musicians are, are not schooled in public speaking. <laughs> it's not their strength. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that I said to her is that when you when you speak, you should be focusing on the group and the, the way that your words are landing with them and make eye contact around the group and take in what they're seeing and what they're feeling and how they're reacting, that that's an important tool in being able to connect with them. But it's kind of counterintuitive because you're supposed to be giving a speech, but you know, conductors, when, when they get really good, when you watch them, it's their, their ability to take in the orchestra and hear what the orchestra is doing and work with that, that enables them to make that orchestra feel like it's one thing. And isn't that what we want of a workforce? We want the workforce to feel like it's one entity, one nervous system, so that everybody has the same idea. And with all of their specialties and the specialization, each is contributing to it in a different way, but they have the same, the same vision, the same values, the same priorities. And that comes about by a leader who can communicate very well. And a big part of communicating is the way you listen. You know, I never really thought about that. I mean, I've obviously been to the not obviously, but I've been to the orchestra several times, and I always saw that conductor as, as just, you know, keeping the pace, the one leading the group, the orchestra. It never really occurred to me that they were really working with the energy of the orchestra and dialing up and dialing down where they need to. I, I never even realized the back and forth, which is really a profound leadership lesson in itself. 
That's right. And another thing is that that happens in music and it also happens in life is that the leader is in a different time zone than the workforce. Mm, yeah. Because, because in order for your directions to be effective and to really influence the group, they have to come at a different time than when the directions are executed. Oh. And that coordinating of your living in the future at the same time that your people are living in the present and by being in their immediate future, you're enabling them, you're have, helping them to steer through all kinds of straits without having any accidents. It only happens if you're in a different time zone. What do you think stops individuals from innovating? When you look out into the teams that you've worked with, what are they struggling with that keeps them from kind of doing some of these things that we were just talking about? Well, that's a big question. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an answer, but I think there could be many answers. Uh, I think people spend a tremendous amount of energy protecting themselves. Um, they protect their reputation. They protect their status. They protect their self-image. They they get focused on that. They they lose the kind of awareness of, of the moment. Uh, and, and then they want to cling hold on to the things that make them feel safe and make them feel secure. And when you go into the realm of possibility, you're going to experience a, a kind of a weightlessness compared with the, the realm in the past where you have gravity and you know, you know what your weight is. So I think as a leader, you try to challenge your people while at the same time, making them feel safe. I think that's really critical. What a tough balance to, to achieve. It is tough, but after all, you know, playing the violin is very tough too. And leadership ought to be, ought to be an art that is equally difficult to learn, equally elaborate, and there's no, just no end to the, um, to the wrinkles and the, the challenges of leadership and the, the way it changes. It's a really, it's a fascinating discipline. You know, I recently read a, I was collecting some data and I read a study that said something to the effect of 75% of people in leadership roles were never given leadership training. And I, you know, I always equate it to, you know, you take a great football player, that doesn't mean he's going to be a great coach. And I don't know if this applies in music too, about, you know, you don't take someone who's great at the trumpet, the violin, whatever, and turn them into a, a conductor, because that role is very different in itself and requires its own set of training. Yeah. But of course, the way people get promoted in business is by being successful at their job. And if they're really successful at it, then they take them off of that job and they make them leaders of other people who are doing it. But the same skills that made them successful at their job are not necessarily going to make them successful as leaders. And I've done demonstrations of that because that happens a lot. And so I, I show, there was one scientific organization where everybody had been a scientist. And of course the most successful ones were now leading scientists, but they were using the same kinds of disciplines that were very successful in doing science. And one of which was being very uh, careful and scrupulous about accuracy. And what they were doing in leadership was with uh, delaying decisions and until they were had the same degree of accuracy. And what happened was the workforce was becoming completely disabled. Right, well, everything's bottlenecked. Exactly, right. So that's a perfect example of how when you when you move from worker to leader, everything changes and it's why people people would benefit from the right kind of leadership training and in a way that's kind of the the business that i'm in now because so much of what i do is uh is about leadership it's a lot that i do a lot about collaboration but i would say even more about leadership before i ask you the last question where can people go to learn more and connect with you well i wrote a book that i alluded to uh it's called maestro a surprising story about leading by listening. There's also a, a website uh, that I devote a lot of attention to, 
which has uh, videos and, and blogs and, 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 and many, many interesting things. And that's simply musicparadigm.com. And it's also a way of contacting me if you're interested because there's a, there's a, uh, a contact uh, heading. So let's, I want to ask you, um, as kind of as the last question, I, I'd love to pull the answer from the book, Maestro, um, and we'll put links in the show notes to the book, your website, everything else. What's one piece of advice for us launch readers out there? Um, you know, one, maybe one piece of advice or one thing we should do kind of based on your book. Uh, if I had to give one piece of advice, I would say stay in the place of possibility, even though it may not manifest itself, it may not present itself. But, you know, tomorrow is not identical to today. And there's, there's more opportunity in tomorrow, but if you, you have to have the right, right mindset for it. You, and if you, if you turn tomorrow into a carbon copy of today, then you're creating a kind of prison for yourself and you're going to end up locked, locked there. But if you can find and be open and awake to that, there could be things that are out there and that you have the power to actually affect. I think that's the important place to be. And it's an important place to get knocked off of. But when you get knocked off of it, as you inevitably will be, you have to find your way back there because that's really the only way to live. Well, that was highly profound. I'm glad you chose that piece of advice. So thank you, Roger. It has been an absolute pleasure. I hope launched readers that you go to the website, check out the book and also check out the experience. I mean, I think this is what Roger here does is is not, I'd say, something that we um, always come across, even in our work in innovation, which is why we wanted to have him on. But more importantly, I, I couldn't agree more with what, Roger, what you're saying about that that music, the ability of, of it, music in itself to transform people. I think we all know and have songs that touch us and move us and remind us of things, but our ability to participate in that and have profound experiences. So for launch readers out there, go check out the website, get engaged and see what this is about, because I think... I think it's pretty amazing. So thank you for coming on. Thank you. I know, right? Fascinating. So the insight that stood out for me the most is how easy it is to get by with people on your team just doing 50 to 80% that you almost don't even notice it. It's like it seems like things are running smoothly and it's not until you achieve true high performance as a team with everybody giving and doing 100% that you even see what's possible. You even see the difference totally kind of blew my mind. I didn't even realize how easy it is to get stuck in good enough and status quo because things run, right? They're fine, but they're really not when you see the difference. All right, go make some music happen. Tamara out. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Launch Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Launch Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LaunchStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.